Hello everybody, my name is Dick Coughlin and this is going to be one of my Patreon requested video replies. If you pledge $20 or more on Patreon, your reward is that you get to pick any video you want, preferably on YouTube, but pretty much in the world, you can pick any video you want send it to me and I have to make a video reply. Now the last two video replies I've done uh, from Patreon requests were both responses to Sargon of a card so I was dreading that this would become a nice little prank that would go on between all my subscribers who would get together and say right let's just make Coughlin respond to Sargon for the rest of his life and quite frankly I would rather shout at one of my own turds. However, this month the Patreon in question very kindly did not pick a Sargon video. Oh no, I've got something much more challenging. Paul Joseph Watson. But pretty much basically Sargon in every way, except he's one fifth of the biomass, so I guess, you know, at least he's a bit more environmentally friendly. Or maybe this is just another theme and I'm just having to work my way through every single member of the new UKIP. And the video was called, and I'm not making this, please hold your breath, the truth about comedy. Now for someone like me, who sees Paul Joseph Watson for what exactly he is, that is the funniest thing, ironically, he's ever said. The truth about comedy. I'm not sure which of those two concepts that Paul Joseph Watson has less right or understanding of, or less right to actually speak about. Truth or comedy? because I happen to be someone who does know a little bit about comedy and in the past I have made several videos along this theme. Unfortunately all of those videos were on my previous channel which got terminated, I lost those videos and I didn't have any copies. So this gives me a prime opportunity because Paul Joseph Watson being the unimaginative fucking shit show that he is has basically offered nothing more but the standard usual bitter and twisted miserable old fucking right wing humorless cunt fucking rhetoric that you I've heard a million times and that I'm going to refute and respond to now. Now if you're new to this fucking channel or you're new to me, <coughs> you where have you been? But I should point out at this point that in, when it comes to comedy, I have a little bit of experience, a lot more I should say, than Paul Joseph Watson. I have been doing stand-up comedy since 2001, November 2001. I did my first ever live stand-up gig in a tiny little room above a pub in Soho. And over the course of the last 17 years, I have performed on every level and on every part of the bill, from headliner, MC, I've done one hour shows, I've done even longer shows, and I've even also, and this is relevant to this bit, I've run my own comedy clubs for a period of about two and a half years back at the end of the uh, late noughties I had five comedy clubs which I did all the booking and emceeing and running of so I know a fuck lot about this which unfortunately means Paul Joseph Watson is buggered here so I'm not even going to need to go into the depth of the video because it's pretty fucking obvious, although he does have one little spin on it. So it's the truth about comedy. And as he sums up, he sums up his video in the description box with the sentence there. It said, and I quote, <clears throat> um, Political correctness has ruined comedy, but the backlash is here. Now... Let me just, first of all, uh, I'm going to have to do a little bit, this is going to be very, very anal and very, maybe seemingly a bit over the top and really, really nitpicky, but I think it's important to do that, to counter the sort of hubristic fucking, just, just nonsense that is spat out by, by know-nothing know-it-alls like Paul Joseph Watson and Sargon. These guys do the minimum effort and speak with the most powerful and, you know, commanding of authority. So I think it's important that there's someone on here who does too much fucking research and goes into too much detail. Now, the problem here is that Paul Joseph Watson seems to think that political correctness has ruined comedy. So, comedy, as it currently is, is not funny, it's not, it, it's bad, and it's because of political correctness. What Paul Joseph Watson is really saying here, folks, is that because a lot of the comedians who are very popular, or a lot of the uh, general sort of sentiment behind most of the comedy that he sees, tends to not be in line with his politics, or tends not to chime with his sense of humour, he has declared that it must be bad comedy. And I'm sorry to break this to you, Paul, but Comedy is not defined by the very narrow by the very narrow definition that do you find it funny? 
If not, it must be shit. And here's the problem with you, Paul. You have a very immature, childish, and extremely cruel and, you know, not very intelligent or deep sense of humour. Your entire political philosophy, your entire idea, the, the very thing that motivates you to get out of bed in the fucking morning is to, is what? Triggering the libs. That's it. That's all you do. And that, Paul, I'm afraid, is not very difficult. All you've got to do is find out what is the worst thing you can possibly say in any given scenario or to any given person, and then say it. I hate the term political correctness or political incorrectness because they've become these badges of honour for people on the right. For people, people like to say, "Oh, I'm, you know, I'm politically incorrect and proud." What is proud? What have you got to be proud of? It's not difficult. There's no achievement. You wear it like a badge of honour, like you're some renegade, like you're some brave, noble, you know, you know, fearless warrior standing at the gates of oblivion. It's not difficult to be a cunt all the time. In fact, it's easier than not being a cunt all the time. So well done, you've achieved, you've learned how to be a prick and apparently that's amusing. Now that's okay when you're fucking 12, 13 years old, but as you grow up, Paul, things are a little bit more complicated than that. The first thing we need to define is comedy, right? Comedy is an art form. It is also a label you can give to a specific creation by an artist. Comedy is defined as a, 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 a an artistic creation, if you will, writing, music, film, novel, whatever. It's, it's something that has been created for the primary or the sole purpose of making people laugh. Now, making people laugh, not making everyone laugh. Comedy does not have to make everyone laugh. There is no such thing as comedy that makes everyone laugh. There is comedy that's very popular. There are jokes that are very, you know, very seem to be very universally appreciated and uh, and enjoyed. But there is no such thing. You will always find some people who do not find certain things funny because funny is not comedy. The word funny is subjective. It is your perception of something you have experienced. If you read a book and you find it funny, you will laugh. But that doesn't make it comedy. This might sound counterintuitive, folks, but comedy and funny are not in any way connected. They are mutually exclusive from each other. Comedy is an objective definition. It is defined objectively. If something has been created and and this is like this is a comedy, its objective is to be comedic. The perception of it is whether the people who are watching it or listening to it find it funny. If they don't, that doesn't stop it from being comedy. And this is a mistake people like Paul Joseph Watson don't understand. They think because they don't find a certain type of joke funny, or because they are a little bit butthurt because they tend to be the people, or the people they like are on the receiving end of it, they, he tends to fall into this un, under this impression that therefore it's not funny. You know, no Paul, it's because you can't take a joke. And it's unfortunate for you because you've used the word politically correct here. Well, that's part of the problem, isn't it, Paul, is you are, you're a bigot. You are an ignorant, narrow-minded, you know, a bigot in many different ways. You're, you know, you are, you are, your mind is closed off. I personally, there are lots of comedians who represent many different um, beliefs and ideologies and have many different views and opinions that are completely and utterly far removed from my own, but whom I find very, very entertaining and in whose work and whose comedy I enjoy. Because I can appreciate that. I am open to hearing that. You're not. The other problem is, Paul, is that you work for Alex Jones. Your politics, Paul, the politics and the positions you hold and the, the sort of position you represent, the area you inhabit on the political spectrum, is one that is generally very, very easy to target and is very frequently targeted by comedians. I myself, if you've watched my videos for long enough, you'll know that 
I have made more videos about Alex Jones than any other single individual subject o over the course of my time here. And it's not just one type of video, there's many different types of videos. I have responded to him in about, to, you know, every, diff every video's got a different style and approach to it. Because Alex Jones is very, is a lot of fun to mock because he is a inherently ridiculous, funny character. He's a joke. But the problem is, Paul, is that to you, he is serious. Now, in this essence, Paul has a bit of a handicap. Because imagine you sat there listening to this. Imagine if you lived in a world where you looked at Alex Jones and he was a serious character. You know, Alex Jones is one of the very few people who, despite the fact that I hate him and I disagree with him and I, di I find his views and his everything he does disgusting and despicable and just, you know, completely and utterly wrong and vile, despite that, I will watch his videos for fun. You know, without even intending to do a response, I can sit there and just watch hours of Alex Jones because he's very entertaining and amusing. And he's my muse. He fucking inspires me to fucking want to do something with this absolute insane bloke. He just looks like a giant electrocuted space hopper filled with horse shit and pubes. And he's bouncing around. It's funny. And you're the guy who's got to sit there and that's your... You know, so you are constantly on the receiving end. Your views, the president of, um, of the United States, a man who you whose anus you sit there and fucking bleach with your little northern tongue, you know, is constantly ridiculed. And that's really what this is about, Paul. Because what do you mean when you say political correctness? Because this is the problem with that term, is it's very easy to throw out and just say, oh, political correctness. I, a couple of years ago, I read an article in the uh, London um, web, on the, on the London um, uh, branch of Breitbart. And in this, um, they were talking again about comedy. It's funny, isn't it? It's always the same sort of people from the same sort of extreme far right side of the spectrum. Don't get me wrong, there are humor there is a there is a numerable humorless cunts on the left who I have to put up with all the fucking time. But it's always the same sort of people. It's always people like, you know, like Paul Joseph Watson or political correctness is ruined comedy, or it's these cunts in the sun like Richard Littlejohn or these people who write for the Daily Mail or these, you know, it, it's wankers like this. And, and let me ask you something, because I can't recall once ever seeing this. Has anyone ever seen Paul Joseph Watson look happy or smile or appear to be or make a joke or have a bit of, or, you know, be, have a bit of Bantz, Eric Bantanar with, with Alex? Have you ever seen that? No. Because he's not, because I don't think he has a sense of humour. You know, this is why he does, the thing that amuses him is the thing that he does as the serious part of his life. Like, I have my politics that I'm very serious and sincere and, and you know, and I care about. Uh, but I have my comedy, which is a separate thing, but I will use them and mix them together. Whereas Paul, the thing that amuses him is just triggering the libs. And the funny thing is, Paul, is... I'm not sure, if, if by political correctness you mean someone's actual political ideals and positions, then maybe, maybe, but political correctness always tends to be thrown out when someone's got in trouble for saying something, like for using a certain you know, word or phrase or you know, idea or scenario within a joke. Right? And, in, when I, and as I was saying, this, this um, um, copy of this Breitbart article talking about comedy actually referred, you know, it used the phrase liberal PC comedian in reference to Frankie Boyle. Frankie Boyle. Now, I think it says a lot about the kind of fucking nasty pieces of shit who work at Breitbart when your perception of Frankie Boyle is he's politically correct. But who else have we got? Who's who else would you classify as politically correct? Um, if it's people who mock Trump and who make fun of your side, um, that'd be Doug Stanhope. I mean, Doug, St Doug Stanhope is the rawest motherfucker out here, and he's a libertarian. I mean, I know that Alex Jones once opened for him, but not anymore. They're not on there. Jim Jeffries, Brendan Burns, Anthony Jeselnik. Um, for, uh, Bill Maher. I mean, Bill Maher does nothing but piss and moan about political correctness going mad and that. You've got people like Jon Stewart, you've got all these other... You know, you've got TV shows, comedy TV shows like South Park. 
which has been going for 20 fucking years. And that is not, that is, you're saying that that's PC, is it? They're Republicans. Billy Connolly, was he, is he politically correct? Because he's mocked Trump. You know, um, what, what about TV shows like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? That's been going for 13 seasons. And there is, if you're going to say that's politically correct, or is it just the fact that it's kind of mocking those sorts of people and that those sorts of people ring a bit true for you? And this is the thing that annoys me about people like you, is you have no concept of where you've been. You, you sit there and go, oh, you can't say anything these days. Yes, you can. Right? It's just that we don't live in... You see, 20, 30 years ago, there, even 40 or 50 years ago, there was a need within... Uh, within society and within the culture at the time for comedians to be the ones to deliberately push the boundaries of taste and acceptability purely for the sake of doing it right Lenny Bruce in the 19 when he was doing history Lenny Bruce was banned the US government deemed it illegal for anyone to allow or book Lenny Bruce. Lenny Bruce performing stand-up comedy was deemed by the courts to be a criminal act and he was banned from doing it. He spent the last four years of his life trying to overturn that decision. And do you know why he was banned? Because he used some rude words. He didn't say anything radical or outrageous or overly offensive. He, it was words literally like fuck and shit. And I'm not joking, schmuck. And all they did, someone went to one of his co one of his comedy shows. They wrote down like a list of like 20 individual words that he said, and they were read out to the court. And he was done for obscenity. People like you seem to forget about obscenity laws and blasphemy laws. This is why you had a lot of stuff. This is why a lot of stuff just couldn't be done when Derek and Clive was recorded at the end of the 70s and sometimes the early 80s, when Peter Cook and Dudley Moore did it. The, you know, these these um, a lot of the um, shops that were selling the first Derek and Clive record, they were seized by police under obscenity laws. You never had bad language on television. You know, you never had. You weren't allowed to say things again. You know, there was a, a time not long ago in the 60s. Pete, speaking of Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, when they went to the Edinburgh Festival with their their um, uh, their one-hour show called uh, Beyond the Fringe, um, one of the big contentions of it was they were what it was treason because they were mocking the government, they were mocking the royal family, they were making fun of the war, and when a lot of people went to see it, they were disgusted and outraged by it. Right? And this doesn't stop here, it goes on. There was a woman called Mary Whitehouse back in the 90s, and, and, and she was one of these moral majority fuckers who would like try and ban anything that was even remotely fun from television. Right? But back then, it was still different, so you needed comedians like Andrew Dice Clay, like Billy Connolly, like Derek and Clive, and like Jerry Sadowitz, and like other such comedians. Comedians who's, who had just this deliberate intent to just go out there and say things that were offensive for offensive sake. Because why shouldn't you? Why should you not be a, why should you be arrested or banned? Do you remember Life of Brian, the Monty Python film about you know the satirizing the uh, you know life of Jesus, right? That was banned. Can you see that being banned now? Now if you go on YouTube and look at any video clip and look at any fucking clip of Life of Brian, go in the comment section. It won't take long before you'll see some cunt come along saying, oh, I tell you what, if you tried to do a film like this about, Mah about Muhammad and Islam, oh, it would, wouldn't be allowed. <coughs> it would be banned. No, because they did do that in 2007. It was called Four Lions. I did a 30-minute video, uh, you know, a, a video about it on my other channel. You should go check that out. That's Four, four Lions was the, the equivalent for Life of Brian. It was a dark satirical comedy, t you know, making fun of and t you know, telling the story of four radical Islamic extremists in Sheffield. Oh yeah, you're from there, aren't you, Paul? Who are planning a to commit a terrorist attack. Right? Wasn't banned. There weren't even protests or outrage about it. The truth of the matter is, and what people like you, Paul, don't want to, don't understand, is that nowadays you can actually say more. You have more freedom 
in comedy to say what you want. And because of that, simply going out there and triggering the libs or saying stuff that's shocking is no longer shocking. This is the thing about comedy. The joke isn't funny the second time, mate. All the comedians you see nowadays, the people who see you see on, you know, on, you know, primetime television, you know, these comedians, like I've said, like people like Frankie Ball, these guys back there, back in the 80s, they would have, you would have, they would have been underground cult figures. You wouldn't have been able to get to get to see them. But, but you look at the amount of actual things you can get away with. You look at jokes and you look at comedy and you look at stuff that is now not that you know would have actually been you know incredibly controversial 20 years ago. That's not the case anymore. The truth is you can say more now than you ever could and when you're in a position where you can say more simply saying what what used to be unsayable isn't enough. You now have to take advantage of this freedom, and that's what you don't understand. And who are your? Who is the backlash, Paul? Who is the backlash to this? Oh yes, people like Owen McDonald, and Norm McDonald, and Pat Condell, and uh, I know that you try and kiss Ricky Gervais's ass, but you've seen I've seen you know Ricky Gervais. I mean I'll, I'll, I'll have problems with him, but he ain't on your fucking game, pal. Yeah, um, yeah. Is that is that is is that the um, all those shitty sketches? Is that is that what the backlash, Paul? Paul, let me tell you something about. Let me tell you something you really want. If because I know that you're going to sit there and say, oh, people like Owen McDonald, who I've seen, and he's not funny. He's a fuck. He's just, he's just again. He's just like you. He's someone who just says disgusting and offensive things under the guise of it being a joke. You know, well, bully for you. Anyone can do that. You know, it's easy. You know, I rape babies on purpose and give them AIDS, you know, and I only do it because they're black, right? There you go, see? See, see how easy that was? It was a joke, right? Uh, right? But if that's what I did, but if you said that, you'd go on Twitter and be like, what, what, what? Right? That's all you're looking for. Comedy is about making people laugh, mate. It's not about just being a There's this brilliant... You know, there's this brilliant uh, misconception that people have about offensive comedy. That offensive comedians are so fucking, you know, that, that you know, comedy, you know, he's an offensive comedian. Listen, being a offending people is not what comedians want to do. Their job is to do, is to make people laugh. That is the exact opposite of comedy. It's like being a DJ who, who, who you know, produces your own dance music and then you go out there and you just play some really slow fucking, you know, alternative jazz or some bullshit like that. You know, or you just put some classical music on. It's like you're doing the opposite of what your job is. Comedians don't want to offend people. Right? They will offend people, but not just for the sake of doing it. They'll offend people by being themselves. You offend people because that's all you know how to do to get attention. You don't know how to make it funny. And it's not that the left is not easy to mock. God almighty, these people are fucking... Some of these people are hilariously fucking stupid. You know? They're right there in front of you. Right? And they're not hard to fucking mock. But I sense, Paul, that you don't fucking get this. Uh, you don't get this and you don't understand this. You know, we've gone past the days where comedy is like this thing where you get people protesting at it or you get people calling for, you know, shows to be banned. I know you get the odd people speak up, but it never comes of anything. You know, people can go on Netflix. People can go on, you know, streaming services. People can have YouTube shows. People get TV. There's more stand-up around now than there ever has been. Stand-up sells more tickets in big arenas, it sells more DVDs, it has more presence on television than it's ever had before. But in your mind, it's been ruined by what? Political correctness? Why? Oh yes, of course, because you are incorrect, Paul, politically. And politically, you're a fool, right? And you don't like the fact that you're on the side of comedy and you're on the side that is generally not perceived to be as funny or creative. Because people want something these days when you hear it. When you see a comedian, you don't just need a load of jokes, although there's nothing wrong with that, but there needs to be something else here. 
And you try, if you think it's been ruined, I mean, I'd love to see you go. You write your little shit, write some of your little classic lib triggering lines down. And then please do me a favour, go to fucking, go to a comedy club and see, not, not, not in my front of your fucking own fans who all sit there and laugh at anything you fucking say. Go and fucking try it. You know, you're bomb. You won't be funny, Paul. Because you're not funny. That's why you're not a comedian. But you could be. Do you know what? That's the tragedy. You actually could be a comedian. Because you've done something that happens to a lot. And it's where a lot of conspiracy theorists uh, start their careers. They want to do something that involves them create, being creative. Like a film. Or, or a book. Or a novel. Or, some, or, 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 or be, write jokes. But what they really want is just to be famous and make money off it and have loads of people think they're great. So they switch around and say, let's just sell all this, all this creative art that we've made and sell it as if it's real and it's a conspiracy. It's what Loose Change did. It's what happened with the Protocols of Zion. It's what's happened with plenty of fucking conspiracies. They start off as, they start off as thick works of fiction and then people just say, nah, just pretend they're real. And I think that's your problem. You, write, you could be a great comedian if you actually wrote the same shit you do now, but instead of giving it to that fucking jiggling, fucking growling hippopotamus that you fucking have to work with, instead of doing that, actually take the piss out of people like yourself. But I think what you mean is when you want to go back to, you think about political correctness, you think of the old days with the working class cub comedians, all of whom were all white males. You know, white heterosexual males, all with different accents, all going doing jokes about my mother-in-law. Oh, there's two black fellas. There's a Jew and a Pakistani and a cripple. There's an Irishman and a Frenchman and a Scotsman and a Welshman. You know, and all of them, all of the jokes were always the same. They had the same stereotypes, and it was all. They never did, and they sit there and would say, "Oh, we do jokes about everyone." No, you do jokes about every minority group. You never do jokes about white working-class sort of the earth Englishmen, do you? You'll do jokes about the gays and jokes about women and jokes about, you know, and jokes about foreigners and jokes about black people and jokes about Chinese people and jokes about Pakistani shopkeepers. You'll do all of those jokes. In fact, it's interesting, the years and decades that went on, the same jokes with the same stereotypes over and over again. And that's you know, got boring. That's what inspired the sort of comedy revolution that included people like Rick Mail and Alexi Sale and, uh, and B Billy Connolly in the, uh, in the early 80s. Because they were just sick of hearing the same fucking jokes with the same dozen fucking obvious racist and you know, bigoted stereotypes over and over again. Jokes that had no meaning and didn't talk to anyone. Right? And it's interesting for me that, you know, these days you hear people like you moan about, oh God, you know, all these, you know, if you see a black comedian, he's going to talk about race. If you see a gay comedian, he's going to talk about sexuality. If you see a female comedian, she's going to talk about men and women. It's interesting how white heterosexual men, you know, only, got, only started getting bored of hearing jokes about race, gender and sexuality when it was women, gay people and black people who were allowed to start telling them and tell them better than you. Political correctness hasn't ruined comedy, Paul, right? You've ruined politics by being incorrect, but it hasn't ruined comedy. And Owen MacDonald and Norm MacDonald and Ronald MacDonald and all of these, they, these people are not, there's no backlash, Paul. Louis C.K. recently went on stage at a comedy club. He was allowed to perform. This is a man who, less than a year ago, admitted to committing multiple acts of sexual, uh, sexual harassment and sexual inappro sexually inappropriate by deliberately, against their will, masturbating in front of women backstage. Bill Cosby, Bill fucking Cosby, right? Even you know, at the peak, at the peak where he was the front, he was the headline story. Well, fit, the, the, peak of his fucking controversy and where when 50 different women have come out and said yes he raped me when it's been we found court documents of him admitting to drugging and raping women in the 90s even even bill cosby was able to sell out theaters and still perform gigs so you're telling me that a man who potentially raped 50 women probably even a lot more than that and Louis C.K., a man who disappeared you know, eight, nine months ago in, you know, in shame, having been exposed as a, you know, doing some very, very unpleasant things to women. These two men can just sashay on stage, despite the fact that they are, they are guilty of committing acts of sexual assault and sexual violence. 
But you, can't, but Owen McDonald can't get a gig because he supports Trump. There's no moral compass that leans towards virtue and liberalism in the entertainment industry, Paul. Do you know what sells? Do you know what? Do you know what the entertainment industry wants? People who are entertaining and who are going to make them money. They don't care what their politics are. If people want to hear them, they will get booked. The problem is, though, Paul, is that you're not, you lot aren't interested in comedy. You're interested in being cunts under the guise and the protective veil of comedy. And that's not comedy. That's just being a cunt. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dick Coughlin. That's the end of this video. I saw it was a bit rambly and went a bit on a bit there, but he, he wanted me to fuck up. I could have gone on a lot, lot longer, but I won't. However, I will say this. If, uh, if you would like to see me make a video response to the fucked art of your choosing, please feel free to go to my Patreon and support it. If you pledge $20 or more, you get to pick a video. Of course, it will be about a month's time at least, because I'm not going to fucking let you just take it off. I've fucking seen that before. If you'd like to support my work on YouTube and uh, my podcast, um, this is my full-time job this is what I have to do for a living and so I very much pre every single penny helps if you'd like to not do patreon you just want to make a donation please go to my PayPal that would be helpful I live on the edge of the gritty never never right but I uh, you know but I put all my effort into this doing this and I think I give you the money's worth as best I can and so if you'd like to support me that would mean a great deal other than that folks my name's Dick Coughlin and by the end of this week hopefully after a very long time I should be able, I should have completed and be ready to upload my second instalment in the Dicksplaining series about conspiracy theories on the Protocols of Zion. Brace yourself. Good night, may God be less.